Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. Kevin, what's going on? Just reliving 2022 in a month. September was rough. Yeah, so let's... uh, Let's dive into it. It's our month end podcast. September was rough. Why don't we start with the markets, how that finished up? Then we'll jump into our month in review and uh, what that looks like, bold predictions, et cetera, a couple articles, and we'll finish with uh, a few good minutes on open enrollment tips. So let's, uh, let's start with the markets. Bringing you a look at the past month and what may come, here's the latest financial update. One of these things does not look the other, and that is this top line here. The dollar surging last month, 2%. It's up 7% since the end of July. Meanwhile, everything else struggling, whether you're in bonds, gold, stocks that are large, stocks that are small, or real estate, all declining last month anywhere from 48 to almost 8%. Do you have Do you have energy up there? I don't, I don't see it. I think the only thing that was up last month is what you have, the dollar. Oh, hold on. And, I'll throw some and- energy on there. Watch this trick. You know, that's been the uh, the catalyst for driving stocks lower. To your point, it's 2022 all over again. Interest rates rising, uh, the prices of energy, oil, it's almost almost hit a hundred dollars a barrel at one point. It's come back down a little bit, but it's been it's been the driver of a of a lower stock market the last last two months. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of reasons why. One of them is the US almost went into a government shutdown. And markets just don't like uncertainty. And so leading to that and then ultimately deciding to extend that deadline by six weeks, it's not something that uh, anybody's excited about. Uh, Maybe Matt Gates, but that's about it. So uh, I think any of that uncertainty is causing a problem. And I think you're seeing it play out in the bond market right now. Short rates, the Fed has kind of paused. Uh, They paused at the last meeting, said they'd probably pause again, maybe one more rate hike at the end of the year. But short rates have been pretty flat for the past month. However, 30-year, 10-year, 5-year spiking, uh, 15% increase, a pretty big jump on that. And there's a new term that many people haven't heard before because it's very rare called a bear steepening. It actually started happening this summer, but it's become more pronounced in the last month as you've seen a spike in the long end of the yield curve. Yeah, and a lot of that too is actually good good growth numbers. Um, the economy, as far as growth goes, doesn't look as bad as as we thought. So interest rates on the back end are are following accordingly. I mean, this is the highest we've seen the ten year. It's at what four, almost at four eight today. Um, mm-hmm. It's the highest it's been in over twenty years. Maybe there's a good chance we hit five percent by the time this podcast is is uh, put out live. Yeah, so a bear steepener is different from a bull steepener, and you hit the nail on the head there. The reason that the long end is rising faster than the short end is really one of two things. One is what you mentioned, economic growth is stronger than expectations. So GDP numbers were positive. I would say there's some holes in that data, like the ISM numbers, as well as labor weakening that suggests that maybe it's not economic growth. And it's the actual other reason, which is there are too many bonds available to purchase. The U.S. Yep. is in- issuing debt like crazy, and the yields are going up, up, and away. I mean, this is almost parabolic. Another week like this, Tom, most of this change happened in the last seven days. Yeah, no, it's it's actually scary. And the, you know, you, you don't have the natural buyer there anymore. You got international rates that are higher. So you have that, you know, we talked about the, uh, the, uh, the international trade being unwound. You have the balance sheet being unwound by the Fed. So it's you have a lot of bonds out there, to your point. So prices are are going down and yields are shooting straight up. If you look at TLT, which is a 20-year government bond index uh, ETF, it's down 50% off of its peak in 2021, 5-0. It's down what you said earlier, 13% just year to date. So if you look at the, the, the three-year return on bonds, it's down, they're down 16%, which is the worst three-year period in, in the history of bonds. 
How much worse would Silicon Valley Bank's balance sheet look if they didn't get taken out in the spring and were still around with all those one and a half and one percent bonds that they held? I mean, those would be down half. Their capital position it was already negative. Would they owe three x what they had claimed in assets? I mean, the, these these banks in the next quarter, if these rates continue to spike and a lot of their loan book or rather their asset side of their balance sheet is long duration assets with low yields, those things are taking a major haircut. Yeah, it's it, it's concerning. And what another concerning area of the market right now is the the carry cost alone that the, we know we talk about this a lot that the government has on this debt at thirty three trillion, the 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 interest rate on our debt just passed um, defensive spending. <laughs> We're going to be it's close number to two item, right? Number uh, almost a trillion dollars just on the interest carry in bonds um, that our government has. It's it's. It's and it's going at an unsustainable rate. To, to your point, so yeah, I, I don't know what what gives, but the stock market does not like it, and it's it's reacting accordingly. And and it's not just bonds; it's other areas that are interest rate sensitive. Look at utilities. This has been one of the widest spreads from utilities underperforming the S and P five hundred. And and especially in the last week, you have utilities almost down twenty percent year to date, with the S and P up about nine. It's a thirty percent. Delta between the two. Um, there's been very few times in the in the history of utilities in the S and P that's that it's been wider. Yeah, and that's why energy is doing well. They are not at all the same asset class. They are following opposite directions. I think part of it also was that utilities were a great yield play, and now the yields are up so much that that yield play doesn't really work. Their debt is not going to be easily serviced, and they're going to have some problems meeting all those distributions they've been making in the last few years that made them so popular with crazy high PEs on companies that don't grow. Yeah, it's been it's been an interesting year. We talk about that magnificent seven. And if you look at the S&P 500, 271 stocks of the S&P 500 are actually down year to date. Uh, the median stock return in the S&P is actually negative 2.32%. So although the S&P is up close to 9% year to date, um, the average stock is is down, and it's down by it's down by a good amount versus yeah. the overall in, in, indice. All right, let's look at a little more data. I got one other chart to show you. Well, two charts, but from the same thing. This comes from J.P. Morgan's Guide to the Markets. They presented uh, you can find it on their website really easily. Dr. Kelly does a call every time it comes out, but I want to look at two things. One is the jolts openings, and number two is just the general trend of the labor market. So if you look, Tom, and you see that this line over here is collapsing, uh, other times we've seen this line collapse back in the early 2000s, back in right before the housing crisis, back in the late 80s. I mean, it goes back several times when you see this jolts number drop, typically followed by a recession. Yeah. No, it's... Um... The numbers are starting to roll over. I think you're starting to see the the cracks in the economy out of all different metrics that you look at, uh, and just where rates are at right now, and the and how the quickly they gone there. Um, it's it is concerning, and uh, you know there's still a lot of forecasters out there that that say we're not going to be in the recession, and there's going to be a soft or no landing. But it's it's literally day by day as the data comes in. So we'll. We'll see what happens. I, I will tell you, I, I don't know if you want to go over th anything else on that chart, but I was going to throw another Just the non-farm payrolls. I mean, we talked about it in the past, but here's the visualizing of us saying it keeps getting weaker every quarter. This is back from uh, beginning of last year, and it's like a ski slope. I, you get snowboard down this time, like right there. And then these numbers have since been revised to be even lower. So we'll see what the economic data says on Friday with regards to the labor market and non-farm payrolls. But you know, these things tend to trend, and this is a pretty powerful almost two-year trend of down. Right, right. Well, I'll tell you, if on a positive note, um, we are entering some, some seasonality tailwinds, hopefully. And I was looking at an interesting stat uh, this morning online. If you look at the S&P 500 over the last 100 years, anytime that the S&P 500 between the first seven months of the year has been up 10% or more, and then August and September had a negative total return. So up over 10% for the first seven months, and then August and September combined were negative. Um, the following quarter, or that quarter, the fourth quarter, 
you had a positive return 12 out of 12 times. There's only been 13 data sets. We're in the 13th. We were just up uh, going into August. We were up about just shy of 20% in the S&P. August through September, we were down about 7%. Um, so now, based on history, the last 12 occurrences, you had a positive return and a significant amount. You were up about 8.5% on average. In fact, there are only a few times where where October, November, or December were down during the during that data set. So um, we'll see what happens so what, this summer. So what I think I hear you saying is that the road to S&P 5000 that that's not closed. I don't think it's, I don't, I, you know, if you're looking at history, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's wiped out. And typically right now, this fourth quarter in the presidential election cycle um, is typically the best quarter that you're going to see in the whole four years historically that we're, that we're in as we speak, but it's not, <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's not a good start to, to the month. I only need 775 more points on the S and P 500 to get there. Back around early part of the year as well this summer, it was tracking there, but it's going to be quite a Santa Claus rally for it to get anywhere close. Unfortunately, these rates are causing problems, but maybe the seasonal tailwinds at the end of the year will pick it back up. Yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. We still have, you know, a possible government shutdown. They just kicked the can down the road for a month. I think it's November 17th is uh, they have to make another decision. Um, by the way, you know when the last government shutdown was? It was in it was in 2019 with Trump, and it was shut down for 35 days, which was the longest on on period. So, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen with if we do get a shutdown, what the markets do with that. But there's been multiple shutdowns, especially over spending gaps, um, in the last handful of years. So we'll see what this. Yeah, I mean the brings. deficit, the budget deficit's at like six percent with uh, 3.5 percent unemployment. So the spending, like you know, out of control at a time when unemployment's not a problem, meaning that the GDP growth is fine, just seems like the wrong decision. This is the time where, okay, we had the COVID crash, we borrowed a lot of money, we're supposed to be paying that back, but they continue to spend, you know, six and it's trending, trending towards 8% of a budget deficit this year. So I wouldn't be surprised if maybe this is a reckoning. Typically, they're just going to kick the can, but with these bond yields spiking, and you mentioned what interest was going to take up. Nobody likes to pay interest. They might even be paying interest less than they like paying taxes. So uh, there's got to be a reckoning. Yeah. Nope. I, I agree. Something's got to give here. Um, and it's it's scary, but we'll we'll see what the fourth quarter holds. So there's still, there's still a chance. Fingers crossed. I'm listening for those Christmas bells. All right. Let's... Uh, All right, should we shift over? Yeah, let's 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 switch gears. So, um, you want to talk about open enrollment and some some do's and don'ts and just some helpful tips? Yeah, most companies, especially larger ones, uh, October, early November tends to be open enrollment, which is your one shot a year, unless you have a life change to update your medical insurance, change your vision insurance, enroll in group disability or group life insurance, uh, a chance to make all those changes. So. Today, we wanted to go through just a couple of tips, things that we see with uh, our clients, as well as things we know people should take a look at during open enrollment. And to me, the first one is evaluating whether or not you can participate in a health savings account. So just as a kind of a explainer, uh, health savings account is called HSA for short. You'll see a lot of articles written about it. Um, the opportunity here is you can put in money pre-tax. It can grow if you invest it in the meantime without being taxed. And when you take it out, as long as you use for healthcare expenses, it comes out tax free. Now, the key here is you have to be enrolled in a high deductible health plan. So if you're somebody that has either an individual or a family that is a call it high user of the healthcare system, this might not be a great choice for you. But if you're generally healthy, don't hit that out of pocket maximum every year. Having a high deductible health plan paired with an HSA is a really powerful either way to save tax efficiently or as another bucket for saving for retirement. Yeah, I think that's a, a good description of it and a good layout. You know, you have to have the high deductible health savings plan. Um, and if you don't, you probably have an HMO or a PPO option. And just know that, you know, look, do a, do a year in review. Look at look at just what took place over the last couple of years. How much did you use it? Did you hit your deductible? Um, and then 
try to plan for the future and what that looks like, because it could be a big difference and a meaningful difference um, in the overall cost that comes out. But you need to know also when your when your windows open and make sure you have the proper tools and resources to know what's even available to you on those plans. Yeah, I, I think that that's a good one. The, the next one I would mention is uh, participating in group life insurance or uh, group disability insurance. So. These are things nobody likes to talk about and they're not any fun. Uh, the easier one is actually disability. So if you are over the age of 50, you need to consider taking out some disability insurance. Oftentimes the cheapest and easiest place to do that is through your group benefits at work. Uh, the reason why is it's group rated, it's not individually rated. So if you're somebody where the odds are against you, you get to participate with the whole group and get a cheaper policy. Um, when it comes to group life, same thing. Some companies will offer you one times your salary, two or three times your salary, for free and you can buy extra coverage on top of that. It's important to evaluate whether it's cheaper there or on the open market. But if you're over 50 and especially if you do a job where you're not just sitting in a chair talking, but you actually are up moving around and requires some, some of your body to be involved. Uh, I think it's essential to have disability. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is, uh, also, so I'm a big fan of disability, big fan of doing the, the group life as well. It's just an easy way disability to get insurance, access. Tom. You're a big fan of disability insurance, disability insurance, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, life as well. You don't have to take a medical test for it. So it's an easy way to just get extra coverage. It's also a good time to take a look at your, your 401k or your retirement plan to see where you're at year to date, if you're going to max it out or not, or if you have maxed it out, maybe next year you try to back it in where you're not maxing out so much in the year because some plans don't have a true up clause in them. And that's really, really important. So, you know, if a company matches you up to 5% each year, but you max out in June, well, the next six months of the year, you're not getting that match. Now, some 401k plans will have a true up clause, so they will true up what they should have owed you if you were to if you were to contribute each month but some don't and that's just in the fine print and the fine writing and we can help you out with that but it's a good time just to review that make sure you're at least hitting the match um you're inside the right investments right investment vehicles and make any changes that you need to uh to the plan yeah and as part of that 401k i think evaluating and rebalancing your account is important the other thing that people probably don't look at is your beneficiary form so each time you go and do this, do a quick beneficiary review. Just see who you have on there as primary. Uh, if you're married, it has to be your spouse. If you don't want it to be them, there's a big process that involves a notary and a, a couple extra pieces of paper to remove them. But typically for most married people, it will be your spouse. Um, but your contingent beneficiary is something to consider as well. Who is it gonna be? Is it gonna be your kids? Do your kids have kids? If something were to happen to one of your kids, do you want your grandkids to get it? The difference between per capita and per stirpes as far as that inheritance, it matters a lot. And so working with either a state attorney or a competent financial advisor to evaluate those beneficiary you know, decisions can be really helpful and make a huge difference for your kids later on because not everybody realizes these act as their own estate. So if your will says Tom gets all the money, but on your beneficiary form, you said Kevin gets all the money, that beneficiary form is going to be the thing that they look at. Yeah, that's a great point. It supersedes all that. And this goes for anything financial related. So bank accounts, um, if you have any old investment accounts or 401ks out there, you know, it's so easy, easily and often overlooked if you, you know, you go through a divorce or to forget to change your beneficiaries. And we've seen nightmare scenarios. So it's really good exercise each year to go do a review of all your financial accounts, whatever they may be, and make sure all those beneficiaries uh, are updated. All right. Great. Uh, bold predictions, Tom? Get your future freezing cold takes as we launch into our latest series of Bold Predictions. Uh, bold Predictions. Well, you know, I, I think it's going to be a real long shot for you to get to your uh, S&P S &P 5000 before, before year's end. Um, there are no <laughs> rules. Anything can happen. <laughs> That is true. Uh, my bold prediction is uh, part two of a banking crisis. So I don't have any information other than that rates are rising. A lot of those balance sheets have some long duration assets on there. And if the Fed is not going to bail them out prior, uh, it looks to me like there's going to be at least another bank failure before the year ends. I don't know who it is. I don't know where it's going to be, but somebody's going down. Yeah, I... <laughs> I think it's. I think there's some more skeletons hidden, and I think we're going to find out real shortly where those are at because this is just. It could get ugly real fast. So I, 
I don't even know if that's a bold prediction, to be honest, at this point. It might almost even be, be <laughs> a lukewarm prediction. Yeah, I would say <laughs> lukewarm. Um, I, I'm sick of making bold predictions on the market. I, I really, I really don't, I really don't know where we're headed right now on, on anything, on any asset class. It's, it is so by the day, whether it's energy hitting $130 a barrel and going back to the previous high or the tenure getting back down to under 4%. I don't know which one comes sooner. I think we have a better chance of, of energy rallying, but I, I'll do a, I got a sports a, one then. I, yeah, so I, have, I have a sports one. I, I think Let's my, my buffs. Uh, with prime time, you know they had a couple, a couple. Of <laughs> oh, rough Colorado! Games. All right. Yeah, yeah, a couple of rough games, but I think from here on out they're going to go undefeated between now and the end oh, of the season. That's it. I'll, I'll bet you anything they won't. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, listen, that's, what, that's why car? it's called a bold a prediction. <laughs> it is bold. I got a bold prediction for you, which actually comes out of your neighborhood, which is the uh, Houston Texans rookie quarterback C.J. Stroud will win rookie of the year. Interesting. Yeah, he's looking okay. good. He hasn't thrown an interception yet. Sorry, knock on wood, all Houston fans. And we're not going to talk about the Astros or the Rangers. They're both in the playoffs, and I don't know. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't feel good about either team. So it'll be fun to watch. We'll get some baseball in October in Texas. That'll be great. You know, I'll tell you who who looked who looked good, and I have to do this shout out because I got in trouble on my last podcast because I have a lot of friends who are Jets fans and uh, they did not look, they did not look too bad. Uh, I think the refs, I think the refs blew the game and they, there were a couple holding know, calls that I think could have been called. would be the nice way to put it. Yep. I, I agree. And uh, you know, who would have thought with their, their stud quarterback out after the first minute and a half of the first game that, you know, they'd be looking as strong as they do. So hats off to the jets. And, you know, it's hard when you're a giants fan, I can't even, can't even talk about them right now. Yeah. I don't know who, who's going to, here's a bold prediction. Which New York team will have a higher draft pick, the giants or the jets, the giants, <laughs> The Giants just look terrible, and the Bills are the Bills. Um, you know, I'm now a Bills fan. That's what usually happens after the first two games. Oh, all right. I just well, you know, now I got college. Now I got I have a college team to follow. I got the Buffs, so <laughs> I got my merchandise and everything. I got hoodies coming my way, pullovers. You know what we should do? We should go to the uh, Buffalo game next. Uh, I guess it's week out. Oh no, it's next week. Let's see if they uh, got a game going on. We'll uh, stop by the stadium. We'll get an autograph, maybe wear our sunglasses like Dion, and uh, we'll cheer they, on those buffs. They, they, it's the first time they've ever been sold out in like the history of the the program. I mean, you can't even get it looks fun. off 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 a uh, off a StubHub. I mean, it's outrageous what he's done for the school and and college right. football. So we'll see if it keeps going. So their games this year have been the highest rated games. Even the game they lost, like forty two to six against Oregon, was mm -hmm. the highest rated college game that day. Who watches plots like that? I don't know if it's car crash or, or what, but I'm all for it. I, I thought the game against TCU was glued to the screen. I think even the almost comeback they had against USC, I mean, they, they're an onside kick away from probably winning that game because USC's defense was terrible. I don't yeah. care if Caleb Fielding, Williams, he, he's not on the field. What's he going to do? Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it, it's interesting. They got Arizona State coming up this weekend, so we'll see. Uh, go Buffs. All right. See you later, Tom. See ya. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.